Hello and welcome to Negotiating Ideas, a podcast about liberty, democracy, and pluralism in Afghanistan and around the world. I'm your host, Omar Sadr, Senior Research Scholar at the University of Pittsburgh. As in the previous episode, this episode centers around the certain normative and ethical dilemmas emerging from the conflict in the Middle East. Since October the 7th and the beginning of war in Israel and Palestine, a number of issues has come up to the forefront of public and political debate, or at least I can say there has been a normative debate on limits of treatings, limits and merits of freedom of speech, particularly in academia and campuses in the United States, how we understand anti-Semitism, and finally, the divergence of views with respect to Israel-Palestine conflict. Some of these issues has been hotly debated to the extent that at least three prominent university presidents were grilled in a congressional committee in the United States Senate. I have a guest today who is a political scientist and a prominent expert on Afghanistan, Professor Barnett Ruby. He is a non-resident senior fellow at Quincy Institute Responsible Statecraft and at New York University Center on International Cooperation, where he was a senior fellow and director of Afghanistan Regional Program for Barney. I am glad to have you here on the podcast. Very welcome. Well, thank you very much, Omar. It's good to see you. Catch up with you. Let me it's start. First time I've seen you since you left Afghanistan, I believe. Yeah, yeah. Um, let me ask you the first question of, from the article that you wrote on responsible statecraft, where you say, if I quote, views on the Israel and Palestine conflict are polarized worldwide between those who have experienced the past few centuries as an East-West conflict and those who have experienced it as a North-South conflict. I think this is is the crux of your argument. So tell us, what do you mean by that? Um, So by that, you really say that this is a, you situate the conflict within a very broader context rather than the region, it is a it has a political dimension, but also it has an ideological dimension. How do you bring all this set of very complex dimensions of the conflict together in this in this article? First of all, uh, I wrote that article in the immediate aftermath of Hamas's uh, attack on Israel and massacre of about twelve hundred people, and before Israel had started its offensive and reprisal. Since that time, of course, uh, since I wrote that article, Israel has killed approximately 20,000 people in Gaza, wounded about 50,000. Uh, there are reliable reports that, that at the highest level of the Israeli government, they're discussing expelling the entire population of Gaza to Egypt And the result of this is, I think that the political situation globally about this conflict is no longer exactly as I put it in that article. That is, it is uh, less polarized because if you look at the recent UN General Assembly resolution calling for supporting the self-determination of the Palestinian people, there were only four countries that voted against it. The United States, Israel, and two tiny South Pacific islands. Mm. So um, that has changed. However, let's go back a little bit and see, you know, the um, today, we, we, before we turned on the, uh, the camera, we were discussing the situation in the world today, you know, that uh, besides Afghanistan, Ukraine, Israel, Palestine, what, it is interesting, and not that many people have remarked on, is that there is a very close link between the conflict in Ukraine and the establishment of the state of Israel. Mm. The president of Ukraine is Jewish. Yeah. At one time, what is today Ukraine was 10%, 20% Jewish population. Mm-hmm. Those people were wiped out by the Nazis. Many of the leaders of the Zionist movement of, and of Israel came from Ukraine, as well as neighboring Poland and so on. Uh, of course, later they were joined by the, all the Jews from the Arab world, as well as from Iran and so on. Um, so looking back on that history, 
uh, people who come out of that history look on it on, on the, what is going on in Israel in, in that context. You know, the coming out of the the, uh, the situation of the Jews in Europe, their persecution, their attempt to find a solution, the feeling that they couldn't rely on anyone else, um, and their eventual success in founding their own state in Palestine, which they considered to be hmm. their historic homeland. Now, on the other side, and uh, of course, Palestine is not just the historic homeland of the Jewish people from thousands of years ago, it's actually a real place, you know, mm -hmm. where people have been living all those thousands of years. And a lot of things have happened in those thousands of years since the Roman Empire exiled the Jewish people from there. Um, the uh, And uh, of course, now most of the population, when Israel, when the Zionists started their movement to establish a state in Palestine, most of the pop population was 96% Arab. Um, at that time, it was part of the Ottoman Empire. Now, the Zionists mm -hmm. never would have succeeded in building a state there if the Ottoman Empire still existed. Now, why doesn't the Ottoman Empire still exist? Because it was destroyed by Great Britain in, as part of World War I. You know? And as part of that, uh, of course, then afterward, Britain, France, and other Western powers redrew the map of the Middle East and they turned it from an Islamic empire headed by uh, an, uh, an em a sultan who was also the caliph, Amir al-Muminin, of Sunni Muslims anyway, mm. into a set of very weak nation states, of weak legitimacy. So obviously Egypt is a, is a strong nation state. It has a history going back 5,000 years and so on. But the other, many of the other countries while they do have long time histories, their histories do not coincide in any way with their current borders yeah. uh, and populations. Um, so, uh, and that was the context, the, Brit the British conquest uh, or defeat of, and dismemberment of the Ottoman Empire was the context in which the British government agreed to support the creation of what they called a national home for the Jewish people, um, which meant that once Adam, once uh, Palestine came under the British mandate, which was just a new form of colonialism, you know, supervised by the League of Nations, um, it was actually supporting the immigration of Jews. Now, now, of course, the Zionists and the British later came into conflict quite a bit because the uh, rapid immigration of Jews, especially after the rise of power to power of Hitler. Uh, and the creation of a huge wave of Jewish refugees trying to find some place to go at a time when they were not permitted into the United States or in Britain, you know, many other places where anti-Semitism was quite strong, if not in the same way as in Germany. Um, that created more conflict with the local people who, of course, uh, whatever their views about Jews, they didn't think that these foreigners should build a state in the land where they were living hmm. uh, without consulting them. Um, so that respect, what Zionism, which appeared to Jews coming from Europe and to Westerners whose historic perspective is centered on Europe, World War II, Cold War, and so on, what appeared to them as a liberation movement, appeared to the Palestinians and to the rest of the colonial world as a colonial movement. Uh, there is a good distinction on the on, in your article, which is not published, and it will be published very soon. Um, you distinguish between original foundation of Zionism, what you have touched uh, upon now, as a liberation movement, and what came later on, and it was aligned with with British colonialism, and and for that you. You discuss, for example, uh, the publication of Der Ner Vig, The New Path, uh, which happened after at the early 20th century, after 1903-1905 uh, pogroms, which happens in Russia. So uh, the, the hatred against Jews was quite high across Europe, but it, the, and, and particularly the Russian Empire at that point of time, Jews finally, particularly the new generation, realized that 
they they have to come together and found some sort of liberation movement. Uh, and there was a political emancipation kind of ins political inspiration for this. So walk us through this journey where Zionism was founded as a liberation movement or uh, an ideal idealization of an independent state uh, for Jewish people, which should, uh, finally they should realize their self-determination. And then throughout um, the post Second World War, it gradually transformed into something different. Well, the the, tr the trouble is, you see, the the Jews living in this part of Eastern Europe that was ha about half of the Jews in the world at that time were actually living in Tsarist Russia. Yeah, which was much bigger than today's Russia. Yeah, um, they did constitute a kind of a nation. You know, they had their own language and culture. They didn't speak the languages of the surrounding people, or they did, but for, to do commerce with them um, wasn't their language. They had their own separate religion. But, of course, to have a state, they had no control over their security, right? So as political movements grew in the 19th century, some Jews thought uh, democracy in which would grant Jews equality, which they never had uh well, no one had had equality before, actually, uh, would be the answer. Others thought, no, we need to be part of revolutionary movements. Remember, Karl Marx was Jewish yeah. uh, or of Jewish origin. Um, and many of the leaders of the Russian Revolution were actually of, of Jewish origin, like, Leon, like Trotsky. Hmm. Um, but increasingly, it looked like they could, you know, by the 1930s, it was becoming the, the prediction that Zionism had made that there was no room for the Jews anywhere in Europe with other people. It looked like it was coming true mm. um, with the Holocaust and with the United States closing its doors to immigrants. Um, in addition to which, even going further back, even at the time that you mentioned at the early origins of Zionism, on the one hand, there was a popular movement of Zionism, self defense, you know, like the the people who fought against the Nazis in the Warsaw Ghetto, many of them belonged to Zionist youth groups, but they weren't fighting against Palestinians hmm. in Palestine. They were fighting against the Nazis who were occupying Poland um, and because the Zionism taught self-defense. So, But to, to actually exercise that in a sovereign way, they needed a territory. And who controlled territories in the late 19th century, early 20th century? The colonial powers. So the leader of the Zionist movement, he tried to negotiate with the Sultan, uh, the Ottoman Sultan. Uh, and so he tried to persuade him to allow the Jews to establish a state. But of course, the Ottoman Sultan, like any other ruler. But there they, they were also alternative plans, Uganda uh, or Egypt, Sinai or Argentine. Yes, because the, the Ottoman Empire was a big obstacle. So they tried, they explored all these others. But... Um, none of them, none of them worked out for, for more or less the same reasons. You know, there are people living everywhere. Um, so, in order to, so the logic of Jewish self determination met the logic of needing to have a territory, and a, a ter and it also they had, there was this very strong Jewish religious historic attachment to this territory of Palestine, which they knew nothing about. Palestine as it actually was. Their idea was about, you know, the Palestine they remembered from the Bible and history mm. 2,000 years ago, which is not the Palestine that existed at this mm. time uh, after all these centuries of Islam and uh, colonialism and so on. So the leaders of Zionism started negotiating with the great powers, and they could see also they were, although they were oppressed in Europe, they were still Europeans. And they were had a certain European ideas, uh, which was you know, that they're civilized nations and they're backward nations. And, mm. and they thought that the Jews deserve to, uh, to attain their rightful status as one of the civilized nations of the world. Oh. Uh, you know, one of the developed nations. Um, and therefore, they started negotiating with the colonial powers, especially with Britain, the major one, over uh, finding a territory. And eventually, the logic of needing to have a territory um overcame the logic of self-determination and self-liberation which 
was the original motivation for the movement in, in Europe. Um, because in that territory, there were people already living who had their own aspirations. That was exactly the same time. The Zionism started at exactly the same time as Arab nationalism right. uh, under the Ottoman Empire. And on Arab nationalism, of course, Arab nationalism was largely invented by Christians uh, who could not identify with the Islamic movements. But the combination of Arab nationalism and Islamic movements uh, uh, is still, you know, still is powerful and still, you know, controversial and and uh, very complex. But so Israel, you know, th th be, so the Zionist movement succeeded in becoming state of Israel through the support that it had from Great Britain and then from the United States uh, and to some extent from France. Um, so that it became, and it's, it's uh, saw itself, and it's still talking about itself as an extension of the West. You may have noted that President Netanyahu, as well as Defense Minister Gallant, uh, both tried to ca characterize the war in Gaza as a war between Western civilization and uh, barbarism or, or something like that, you know, which no, not many people have actually accepted that characterization. Um, but that that is, that is partly a result of the history of the movement. Definitely, there, there, there is continuous attempt to, to characterize the conflict and, and a kind of dualistic nature between evil and good, between civilized and uncivilized. And we can come to that, but you have also touched upon so many other issues that um, uh, emergence of Arab nationalism and uh, was parallel to emergence of uh, Zionism in the region. And many scholars also argue how Arab nationalism, even the very first secular origin of it, um, had also seeds of anti-Semitism. Uh, in your paper, in your article, you, you quote, um, Najib um, uh, Zori, um, um, who has been one of the prominent uh, um, Lebanese Christian Arab nationalist. Um, but apart from um, Najib Zori that you have quoted, I, which is I think <clears throat> I don't what I don't know to what extent his ideas traveled across Arab regions, given the fact that he wrote um, his his thesis and his book and a language that most of the Arabs were not speaking. It was not originally written in Arabic, but also he was not from mainstream. He was written in French. He wrote in French. Yes, it was in French. And then he was also a, a, a Christian. Um, but many others also argue that, that the ideas that Najib proposed was not much uh, intelligibly taught, and it was not transferable to, to a large extent understandable for the common people of Arab in that region. But there were other Arab nationalists at that point of time who really um, shifted the atmosphere of um, um, Arab nationalism at that point. And one is Salama Musa, and the other one is the, the Yemeni uh, writer, Saute Al Hasri. Um, so, how do you see um, transformation or of anti Semitism from an European ideology? Uh, which was quite strong there in, in Europe rather than in Middle East, or transferring it to the Middle East, where a, a number of Arab um, secular, not Islamists, back then Islamists were not prominent in Arab region, who somehow internalized and tried to um, found Arab nationalism on one of these key pillars. Do you, do you consider anti-Semitism as one of the pillars of early Arab nationalists? No, I don't, but I'll tell you, it, 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 here's, the, here's the connection. See, as we've been discussing, early Arab nationalism, early Arab nationalist ideologues were largely Christian. And as you mentioned, some of them, like Najib Azouri, they wrote in French. Um, there was a big anti-Semitic incident in Damascus in the 1830s where the Jews of Damascus were accused of using the blood of a Christian child for their religious rituals. But the, the, it came from the Christians in Damascus, not from the Muslims. Mm. See, And uh, there is a very important Palestinian leader named um, 
Yusuf Dia or Yusuf Zia Al Khalidi, who is the great great grand uncle of Rashid Khalidi, the, the historian, uh, who wrote a letter to the Theodor Herzl, the leader of Zionism warning him about all the things that have happened since then if he went ahead with his plan for a Jewish state. And one of the things he mentioned is that there are fanatic, among the Arabs, there are fanatical Christians who are uh, against the Jews. You see, so um, I think anti-Semitism among the Arabs or anti-Jewish feeling, of course, there were always religious friction among the different religious communities and so on, which went up and down over the centuries in different locations and so on. But as an organized ideology, it was part of the westernization of Arabs, of Arabs yeah. uh, uh, as was nationalism. Mm -hmm. you see? Mm -hmm. And it's not a coincidence that this first tract of Arab nationalism, which was also anti-Semitic, actually, was written in French. Now, after the establishment of the state of Israel, it became different because I would, I would define anti-Semitism as some kind of prejudice against or hatred of Jews based on nothing. But, uh, you know, but, but uh, so resentment of hatred of Jews and so on became much more widespread in the Muslim world and in the Arab world after the establishment of Israel yeah. and expulsion of 700,000 Arabs from the territory of Israel and the emergence of and the Jewish state going to war against many of the new Arab countries. So, Sometimes, so that feeling that opposition to Zionism, of course, sometimes in, you know, as we, the way average people think or simple people or the way politicians think, uh, they don't make a distinction between someone's ideology and their ethnicity. Mm -hmm. Certainly you are familiar with this in Afghanistan. Yeah. It's extremely common, you know, if they're against the ideology of a certain political party, they they blame it on the ethnicity of the people who are lead, leading that political party. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, similarly, um, so it, it became, but it was based on something. In other words, you could say, what did the Jews do to the Germans? They did nothing to the Germans except make them richer, more cultured, and uh, and uh, have better scientific research. Hmm. Um, but what did the Jews do to the Arabs? Well, they actually expelled as a, an organized, not the Jews, but an organized Jewish political force. Hmm. Uh, established a state on Arab territory and expelled hundreds of thousands. So there's a basis for this hostility, which some people elaborated into something beyond beyond just uh, that political conflict. Yeah, but uh, you you give a definition of anti-Semitism as a simple hatred and prejudice against Jews. Um, I recall reading uh, Basim Tebi, who is a well-known Arab uh, political scientist and. And he uses on our end's definition of anti-Semitism in which she distinguishes between Judophobia, which is, as you mentioned, it, sprinkles of it might exist in every community or religious group against the Jews. But most importantly, what we should understand is anti-Semitism is something beyond an Judophobia, which is um, for on our end, it's a genocidal ideology that you accuse Jews for certain form of conspiracy that you may have, or as you said, hatred based on nothing. Um, so uh, I want to have your opinion on how can we understand between Judophobia and anti-Semitism on one hand, but on the other hand, also something which is quite controversial. <clears throat> Do we have to distinguish between anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism? Anti These two are two different things. and how can we really think about these two different phenomenons or concepts correctly? Well, uh, you're quite right. I mean, the thing is, uh, there have been, um, Jews were subject to various discrimination in all, especially in Christian lands, but also to a lesser extent in Muslim countries for, you know, hundreds, thousands of years. And mostly, uh, that was, of course, the real basis for it was economic competition or, or or struggle for power or something but it was it was um legitimized with reference to religion hmm. with meant that basically a Jew who converted to Christianity or Islam did not ex was not subject to it anymore now sometimes they still were you know but but 
not in the same, like if Jews were expelled from a country, if they converted, they could stay there. Sometimes they, they were still persecuted. I won't go into the details here, but as part of the secularization of Europe, see again, the modernization, secularization of Europe, this religious basis, Judophobia, was developed into scientific race race theory. Yeah. Which was also connected to colonialism because mm -hmm. it was not just aimed at Jews. It was part of a whole sy ideological system, which also justified the slavery of uh, the enslavement of Africans, the inferiority of other races, and claimed that human beings were divided into different races. But according to the anti-Semitism, the Jews were, were not white or European. They were a unique race mm. with this, uh, with this um, evil essence that was trying to take over the world. Now, of course, elements of this conspiracy theory, you know, uh, you do hear, for instance, most, some statements by the Muslim Brotherhood uh, echo some of this. Yes. Um, again, I would say that's part of the westernization of uh, the Muslim world, because after all, the Muslim Brotherhood is something that was developed in the 20th century in yeah. reaction to modern politics in Egypt. It's not the time of Prophet Muhammad. Um, and uh, also, of course, lot, much of the Muslim world was engaged in an anti-colonial anti -colonial struggle against Britain and France, yeah. who were fighting against Germany. Yeah. So naturally, the, the, the people who were fighting against Britain and France gravitated to Germany, and they might have absorbed some of Germany's ideology. But I don't. But there is, is no sign of a really deep. In, uh, ideological basis for anti-Semitism in the Muslim world. It's an it's an outgrowth of you know religious conflict over years and the current political conflict, which is then uh, elaborated by some people by this very virulent by the using this virulent ideology imported from Europe. Yeah, um, that that's exactly true. I think I I, I echo what you say and and Muslim Brotherhood. Um, though it was founded in 1928, but later on it's Said Qutb, the main ideologue, um, who writes a book, Our Struggle with the Jews, in which he argues that um, Muslims should uh, pay tribute uh, to those Yorks who joined the war against the Jews, and there's a continuous war, with, and the conflict is uh, endless. Uh, and this is, uh, he, he he's coins the term uh, conflict of minds, jangaf kar, what, what is translated in Farsi and Arabic. Um, that Because Jews back then when he wrote the book didn't have a state and the army, he said Jews of course don't have the army to fight the Muslims, but they fight with the ideas and ideologies and hence the Muslims should be prepared to counter this. And and there are many other episodes that you read even followers of Said Qalb or even the very prominent recent Muslim scholar Al-Qarzawi who spoke about the, the issue of Palestine and Israel for even for Al-Qarzawi this he argued that there's no dialogue between Muslims and Jews the dialogue is dialogue of battle and swords some, some I'm paraphrasing these terms so um, I think that Anti-Semitism within Islamist ideology is substantially different from that of secular Muslims anti-Semitism. Of course, I think one of the ideas that even um, the author that earlier I quoted but seemed to be says that the secular Arab anti-Semitism was not so much genocidal to the extent that Islamist anti-Semitism is fundamentally genocidal because, and he argues it's one of the key pillars of Islamism, particularly the um, uh, Juan, the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, starting from Bana and then continuing to Said Qutb. So, so I think that 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 should be distinguished. But now I want to also bring you to to somewhere else. Uh, we discuss anti-Semitism and Christian Arabs and Islamist Arabs, another part of the world that you are expert of Afghanistan, and I. Time and again, I listen to people when they talk about Taliban, something which is not at all related to Israel and Palestine conflict at this moment. But at both sides of the party, who are those who are pro and anti, I hear certain form of assertions, which one can say it's anti-Semitic. For example, it is argued that the Taliban is, a, is of course, a, 
kind of colonial project, quote unquote, or it's a it's a, a con it's conspiracy theory behind it, where the Jews are there to support the Taliban, or Israel is there to support the Taliban, or or other way around. When Ahmad Masood traveled to Moscow, um, a, a, a kind of fake news leaked where it was stated. You mean that, uh, Ahmed Masood, the younger, uh, young, young Ahmed Masood? Young Ahmed Masood. Masood. A fake news was released that he received support from Israel, and then the entire Taliban propaganda was really anti-Semitic, which he said that this guy is Israeli agent, and, and his father was the same way. Uh, and then the entire community that he belonged to was also pronounced the same. So how do you see, uh, given your long experience with Afghanistan, how do you see that kind of sentiment in, in, in Afghanistan? And how do you encounter, whether you encountered or, or not with such kind of feelings and thoughts? Uh, well, I personally encountered it, but only in a very mild forms. And usually... If I had offended someone, then the issue might, then it might <laughs> become an issue, and uh, then if I reconciled with them, it was no longer an issue. Uh, but of course, first of all, um, there was a Jewish community in Afghanistan for a very long time, uh, since maybe 500 BC or yeah. something. Of course, before uh, before it was Afghanistan, before, there was a before. Jewish community in Khorasan. You know, which was part of the, the Silk Road, you know, Bukhar, Bukhara, Herat, Kabul, Balkh, Memana, they all had, uh, Jew even Ghazni, there were Jewish communities. Um, and in addition, there are some Pashtun genealogies that claim that the Pashtuns are descended, they don't say from Jews, but from Bani Israel, which is the word in Arabic is the same in, in Hebrew. It's called it's Bnei Israel, which is the term used in the Bible for the the, uh, the the people who followed Moses, members of the tribe of Israel. Um, and the reason for this, you know, according to this, um, the descendants of King Saul, who was known as Kish, tra uh, were exiled and went to um, um, Lord. Province. Hor, yes, went to Hor province, you know, and there is a Jew, old, very old Jewish cemetery in Hor. And the, at the time they heard of uh, the arrival of Prophet Muhammad, they sent an emissary to Prophet Muhammad and they accepted Islam directly from him. Now, what I interpret this as meaning, I don't think, I, I don't believe, there's absolutely no evidence that this actually happened. Hmm. But what it means is they're claiming that Pashtuns accepted Islam directly from the Prophet not because they were conquered by Arabs, you see. Uh, so it has an important uh, ideological element to it. Uh, so there's that kind of philo-Semitism. People have told me that Zahir Shah, for instance, used to say that Jews are our people, and he, he allowed them to open a synagogue in Kabul, and, and so on and so forth. But at the same time, you know, Afghans were also very sympathetic to the Germans for the same reason that many others were, because... Afghanistan's history was a struggle against uh, Britain and Russia. Yeah. And uh, Germany was fighting against both Britain and Russia. Mm. Uh, so that led to some pro-German feelings, which also led to some spread of some Nazi ideology uh, there. And then, of course, as the Muslim Brotherhood ideology grew, that also uh, that was also imported into Afghanistan. Now, what I see now is it's it's there. But it's not very deeply rooted on any on any side. Like they, you see, the examples you cited are people use it. They try to use it against their enemies. So if you're against the Taliban, you try to say that Israel is behind the Taliban. If you are against Masood, you say that Israel is behind Masood. Yeah. I don't know if anyone really believes these things, mm. you know, mm. <laughs> uh, or they they don't teach these things in schools or is it's Definitely. it's pure political propaganda that's right that's right that's, i think that that is exactly because of the long peaceful coexistence in medieval uh, and ancient cities of the region including mm -hmm. the ones that you mentioned herat bukhara samarkand where uh, Jews were part of the community. And I, I recall reading one of the early, in 1950s, a scholar called 
um, Eric Brower has written an, an article on the Jews of Afghanistan, an anthropological account, mm. in which he, he, he writes, if I quote for you, that not only do Afghan Jews speak a dialect of Persian, but their communities are located in the northwestern region of the kingdom among Tajiks. Um, and he goes on to distinguish um, Jews of Samarkand, Bukhara, Herat, north of Afghanistan from the rest of the Jews as a, a like, there is a quote unquote identity also in our region, which is called Persian Jews. I heard from some Jews in America, which they are not comfortable with the term Persian Jews or Tajik Jews, because Jews are Jews. It's considered, though it's not race, you have written on it, but mm -hmm. it's considered that the distinct group of communities, which is which is not at all American or it's not. I'll tell you, one, one community that has a very distinct a, a, uh, existence is the, the Bukharai Jews. Bukharai Jews, which are predominantly Persian speakers, I suppose. Yes. Now, the, the, the Bukhari Jews, it doesn't mean Jews only from Bukhara. Yeah. It means the Jews from the old emirate of Bukhara, right. which was like all of, all of uh, Khurasan. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 And so that, that kind of peaceful coexistence which existed in the region, um, where people shared uh, happiness, weddings together, and other kind of communal ceremonies, that does does not allow people to become anti-Semitic or teach their, their kids um, or write uh, in terms of history and other things against a, a sort of hatred against Jews. Anyway, but... Um, Let's talk about the last thing that I, I might also be interested to speak with you is about how can we understand some of the other controversial concepts, probably in American <clears throat> political debates about who are settler colonialists and who are indigenous. And, and you have touched upon this in your article that which is unpublished, which will be soon published, History, Rights and Wrongs uh, about the Jews. Um, and you say, yes, both Jews were, um, they were uh, at some point uh, immigrants, but at, at some other point also they con turned to become a settler colonialist. So how do we understand this? The story is, com of, of course, complicated, complex, and we should avoid such kind of binary depiction of um, any kind of community or people. But how shall we navigate this complex history that, Jews were also indigenous to the land uh, and in Palestine, but at some point they were expelled two times in their history and then they returned back. And, and the way that the Arabs um, have since 1930s and the Peel Commission, which proposed the very first uh, partition and later on United Nations. So that, that controversy over land remains. So how do we understand these two uh, concepts that you rightly unpack them and indig being indigenous or uh, colonialist settler? I think to understand the way these concepts work, you have to go back to the ideology of nationalism, ethno-nationalism, the way it, it arose in Europe, which posited uh, some kind of organic link between a nation, a cultural unit, and a territory. It's what is sometimes called blood and soil nationalism. So that a, ter a territory belongs to some collective uh, un cultural unit. Now, this is not factually true, you know. And it's like if you if you see, it's like country ethnic groups that try to show what their real territories are they go back in history and find the point of history where uh, their ethnic group controlled the largest amount of territory you know so greater punjab okay greater punjab is bigger than pakistan it includes most of <laughs> north india afghanistan you know maybe bukhara too you know and so on and so forth yeah. uh, and uh, greater germany was like that, you know. So all these great, these great, these greater ethnic projects are incompatible with each other. So they're formulas for hatred and war, and they're based on a kind of um, uh, mythical idea of indigenousness, like that ethnic groups are homogeneous. Now, if we go to, to Palestine, of course, the population of Palestine uh, is not. It's not like it's not a family or a tribe. It's a group of of people who have migrated from different places 
adopted different religions over many, many thousands of years. And to say that, and to take one identity which happens to exist now and project it back in time to saying that's the eternal real identity of this land, is it's a political project. It's not a fact. Hmm. You see? So uh, for Jews, this land has a, a very important religious significance because their exile from it twice, according to their yeah. religious history, was a punishment from God. And in the end of the days, the Messiah, the son of David, will come and they will return to the land. And what Zionism did in a way was act that out in a secular way. You know, it was a secular way of, of bringing, bringing the Messiah. Um, and, uh, but it, that, okay, so that's their historical memory. But the fact that they have that historical memory doesn't give them a right to take away any land from the people who are actually living there. Hmm. Right. But on the other hand, as the opponents of Zionists have said, no, this is all a fiction. The Jews have no attachment to Palestine. This is just made up by the colonialists, for the, which isn't true. The Jews did have an attachment to Palestine, but that doesn't give them any rights to take the land away from other people who are living there. Hmm. You see, there are the relationship of identities to territory uh, is some fluid changes over time. There are overlapping claims, you know, like you're from Herat. So is Herat part of Afghanistan? Is Herat part of Iran? Is Herat part of Khorasan? And the answer is at different times, Herat was part of all of those things, you know, and all of those things go into the making of the uh, ideal of the identity of today's people of Herat. And to try to just say it's one or the other, you know, would not be true to, uh, to history. Sure, sure. So with that said, um, can we imagine any peaceful resolution in, in Israel and Palestine, given the current context that Gaza, is, the war in Gaza and the military uh, operation of Israel there doesn't seem, there, there doesn't seem to be a plan in, in current Israeli cabinet to, uh, uh, to leave Gaza militarily and transfer it the political administration to, 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 to a neutral administration, probably to the West Bank uh, for the Palestinian Authority or any other kind of agreement which emerges, which should emerge eventually between uh, some of the um, prominent Arab countries. But Biden administration is trying to push that one. But um, anyway, but finally, the dispute over land, which is also entangled to with history and ideology and identity, and there's a there's a material part of it that there's a, a value and identity part of it. It's it's quite complex. So, at this context that we are there, some prominent scholars may argue that there should be a, an opportunity to finally uh, come to an end of this conflict and and lay a kind of political roadmap. What do you think? Do we have an opportunity to finally draw a solution for it or not? I don't think we have the luxury of doing analysis about whether we have an opportunity to do it or not. We have to try to do it. Mm. Whether we have the opportunity to do it or not, we have to try to do it. Because the current situation is completely intolerable. Uh, and uh, of course, objectively, if you wanted to ask me what is more likely to happen, what is most likely to happen is more horrible things. Mm. But um, I, I, you know, I think that it is our responsibility. I'll just say me, I feel there's not much I could do, but I feel it's my responsibility in whatever small ways I can to try to work against that. And uh, and I, I know there are a lot of other people that, that think that, um, but the dynamic of the current situation is, is toward violence and hatred, of course. Mm -hmm. And the Israeli government, current Israeli government, which is a very right-wing, practically fascist, racist government, mm. um, their idea of uh, peace is complete domination. Yeah. They don't even call it peace, you know. Mm -hmm. It is complete domination, which, of course, will never work because those who are dominated will rise up unless you completely exterminate them. But, you know, the most successful extermination project so far in history was the well, well, I guess it was, well, I, it's hard to say what that is. It was the exterminate, maybe it was, I was going to say the German, the Nazis against the Jews, but maybe the uh, American settlers against the Native Americans was more 
uh, was even more effective. And I'm sure there are many other such genocides that we maybe don't even know about. But at any rate, um, you know, people should not confuse trying to accomplish something with optimism. Hmm. But we have no choice, in my opinion, but to try to accomplish something. And there, in a way, the, the basic principle is somehow or other, all the people that live in that land should have equal rights, as close as you can get to it. You know, nobody has, no, in no country does everyone have absolutely equal rights, not in Afghanistan, not in the United States, just to pick, you know, your country and mine. Um, but as, uh, they should at least have some ability to participate in politics and so on. So there are basically two models for how to do that. Each one, one is two states, one for each people, and the other is one state in which everybody has equal rights. Which one is feasible? Uh, do you think even some scholars may say now at this moment, even two-state solution may not look visible, given yes. that- Both of them look like completely impossible, mm. uh, I would say. But I would say that the two-state solution is may be slightly less impossible mm. uh, because it has some international support. And it's hard to imagine two states, Israel and Palestine, living in peace with each other, Israel with an Arab minority, Palestine with a Jewish minority. But it's even harder to imagine a state that is 50% Israeli Jews and 50% Muslim and Christian Palestinians. They wouldn't even be able to agree on what to call their country mm. uh, or what to teach in any of the schools. Uh, so it, it's an ideal that is attractive, but I, I just, it's harder to imagine how it would work. But of course, in the current situation, uh, it will take, you know, decades and decades and it will take, it will take strong intervention by the United States and other great powers. And I don't, and the condition of the United, let's remember the condition the United States is in. The United States is in terrible condition. Mm. <laughs> and it's very politically divided and uh, now the Democratic Party is very politically divided as a result of this war in Gaza Yeah. Uh, so I don't see much leadership coming out of the United States so I have to be both pessimistic and hopeful at the same time it's a difficult combination but I got used to it from working on Afghanistan for many years that is understandable and there are more to talk, of course, and I continue this conversation with you, Bernie, but uh, but I have to uh, end it here. Uh, truly grateful to your time and interest in this episode. Uh, it was a pleasure talking to you. Thank you very much, Omar, and thanks you very much for thinking of reaching out to me, and let's continue this in the future. Sure, of course. And thank finally, you. I would like to also thank our listeners. I hope you enjoyed listening to Dr. Bernie Truthby. Please subscribe to the podcast and make sure to share it with your friends on social media. Looking forward to talking to you and connecting to you in the next episode. Okay.